and I will see the life run out of you. No pulse at all. She's dead. Like I said. If you haven't heard a good ghost story lately, it's time you went and saw one. And ghost story is a pretty good one to see. It seems that once about 50 years ago, four college boys accidentally killed a girl and then tried to cover the mishap by pushing a car with the girl in it into a pond. And now, 50 years later, the girl's spirit comes back to make the now four old men pay for what they did. I like good scary movies, ones that have a unique and intriguing story that keeps you on the edge of your seat. I don't like bloody, knife-slashing, cheap horror movies that seem to have been invading the theaters lately. For instance, The Exorcist had me gnawing my digits for the entire two hours I was so caught up in its terror. A ghost story isn't quite like that. In between the scary scenes and ghost story, all there is is story, which isn't very suspenseful. This movie has mostly what I call jump scares, which is equivalent to someone standing behind a closet door and yelling in your face when you open it. In other words, unexpected things. In The Exorcist, I knew something terrible was going to happen because the whole film is set in a horrifying situation, and yet I was still scared out of my wits even when it did happen. So my point is, Ghost Story isn't two hours of fright, but it is a real interesting concept with some very frightening and gruesome scenes. The girl who is doing all the spiritual tricks has also presented herself to the son of one of the old men in an effort to work through him. However, he is able to see through her, so to speak. After two of the old men had been literally frightened to death, the remaining two and the young man return to the scene of the murder in hopes of finding something that will put an end to all their nightmares. I thought I'd set foot in this house again. If only we'd been 30 instead of 20. Fools we were. Nothing will come of this. Don't argue with me. I'm too old, too tired, and too frightened. Sears, I'll be back with help as soon as I can. Well, help doesn't arrive, and Sears doesn't come back. One of the more interesting things about the film is the four actors they've assembled to star in this movie. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. is excellent as the young boy's father. Melvin Douglas is convincing as the terrified town doctor. And John Houseman is his typical domineering self. And Fred Astaire is delightful as Ricky, the carefree, independent soul of any age. So if you like good spook movies, I recommend Ghost Story. If you like musicals, old songs, and good dancing, I recommend Pennies from Heaven. And coincidentally, Fred Astaire appears in Pennies from Heaven in an old film clip doing a song and dance number. Some critics are calling this film Penny's Gate in reference to the disastrous Heaven's Gate, but I feel that no comparison could be further from accurate. I thoroughly enjoyed this throwback to the old MGM musicals that adds touches of originality throughout. There is no comedy in this film starring Steve Martin, but I found myself tempted to stand up and applaud on several occasions at the superb talent and choreography displayed. I rank this film right up near all that jazz, except with a not-so-cerebral story. Martin plays a music sheet salesman during the Depression who's married to a frigid wife. Not getting any companionship from her, he sets out to build a life of his own. The first thing he needs to do is get a bank loan to start up his own business, but the banker denies him. You mean to bring a man down just like that? You mean bastard. Good day, Parker. Yes, yes. My baby said yes, yes. I'm glad she said yes, yes. Instead of no, no. Next Sunday, I didn't say Monday. Every 10 or 15 minutes, the movie breaks into another one of those extravagant scenes that are just delightful and amazing to watch. And by the way, none of the actors ever sing. They lip-sync all the songs with old-time popular vocalists. And as you saw in that scene, no attempt is made to match a female song with a female vocalist. Even further down on his luck now, Martin picks up a bum, and the two of them stop to eat in a roadside diner. And no one congratulated a moon that was always new Every time it rained, it rained And he's from heaven Don't you know each cloud contains And he's from heaven 
Later, while trying to make a sale in a store, he sees the girl of his dreams and tracks her to her home that night. What do you want? How do you know my name? I mean... Go away. Leave me alone. Oh, don't. Oh, please. Please. You've been in my head, Eileen. And in my heart. In my soul. Eileen, come here. I don't even know who you are. Arthur. And I love you. He eventually comes in and finds that she has been betrayed by another man and is scared to get involved. So he gets her feeling sorry for him by telling her that his wife has died and he really needs someone. Of course, she buys the whole story and the next day in school can't keep from bursting with excitement. Quiet! <laughs> scenes are just super. What a creative and enjoyable way to tell a story. But anyway, Martin leaves her and returns to his wife, not knowing that he has left Bernadette Peters pregnant and consequently jobless. However, Martin soon gets fed up again with his frigid wife, especially when she doesn't respond at all to an erotic story he tells her, and goes back to Peters, finds out about her condition, and offers a suggestion. They gave the elevator operator a $20 bill to stop the elevator between floors. Turn his back. Do people do things like that? Like what, Eileen? Make love in an elevator. Well, you mean like kissing, do you? Oh, that all. Would you ever do that? Between which floors, Arthur? <laughs> this is the girl he has been waiting for. But when he returns home to his wife again, she offers him something else he's been waiting for, a chance to open up his own record shop using her father's money. So Bernadette is left out in the cold again, and with nowhere else to turn, she walks into a local bar. Never know what you like till you try it. Can you lend me five dollars? Lend you? You are kidding. Caught a little short. That's nothing to be ashamed of, baby. Not nowadays. What's your name? Lulu. That's a very nice name. I don't like it very much. It makes me sound cheap. Nah. Nobody would ever say that. Well, things continue to bounce from good to bad for Martin and Peters, but like all the old musicals this film is emulating, it winds up with a happy ending. In that bar scene, Christopher Walken has a dandy song and dance number, and later on Steve Martin has one as a vaudevillian that is just great. But I'm not sure who would like this film. Certainly not Steve Martin fans looking for a comedy, but I just really had a great time watching Pennies from Heaven, and I hope a lot of you agree. Oh, just leave it to me. What a gown this will be. Look, glass slippers. Goodbye. No, wait. Senorita. Ah, uh, the classic Disney version of Cinderella is back at the theaters. Just as delightful as it was when we saw it for the very first time, whenever that was. How can any critic not recommend this film? Cinderella was about the most enjoyable film of the holiday season, and it's good for the whole family. You know, there's another film out that has to do with kids, but it's meant for adults. It's called Taps. I've been informed that Bunker Hill Academy is to be closed. Attention! Major Mullen, he's our man. They don't scare us, do they, Charlie? No, sir. Me neither, sir. They don't scare me. What in God's name did they teach you in here? You and I have nothing more to talk about. As was evidenced there, the film deals with the events at a young boy's junior military school after the cadets have been told that their institution is about to be closed down. George C. Scott stars in the first half hour of the film to establish the story and the motivation. An end to nearly a century and a half of tradition, and an end to the heart of us. 
It is the decision of the Board of Trustees and all their wisdom that this institution be sold and the land developed for its real estate potential. I am a veteran of many terrible battles, but no battle is more important than this one. And this final battle, I intend to win. As it turns out, it is a battle he is incapable of even fighting. A bizarre set of tragic circumstances leave him in critical condition following a heart attack. But the cadets who idolized his leadership, in particular one Timothy Hutton, intend to defend what they feel is theirs, using all the military weapons and knowledge they have thus far accumulated. But the overriding question that this film raises is, are we training our young people in these academies, blind discipline and the use of weapons, before we teach them common sense and right from wrong? It's a very good question, and a very good movie. I recommend TAPS. I do not recommend the new Chevy Chase comedy, Modern Problems. This movie is so terrible, I don't even know where to begin. In the first place, all the big to-do made about this movie being very timely because he's an air traffic controller is a real crock. Here's the entire time dealt with that fact in the movie, and it all happens in the first minute. Oh, I'm special. Over. Roger. What else? Chicken, ham and cheese. Johnny Tuna? Right I don't you. know. This is Air France in Bern from Tunis coming in at 325. 350. Over, oh, France. 350 for tuna? Copy your collection. Coming in at 350 from Tunis. Not you, Tunis. Maintain 325. Okay, first remove the body from the pilot's seat. You turn right, you go right. You pull up, you go up. You push down, you go down. Well, the laughs continue at that hilarious pace. And one night, his sunroof gets stuck open while he's driving behind a nuclear waste truck. And of course, as we all know, when you get liquid nuclear waste spill on you, you develop telekinetic powers that enables you to play funny magical tricks on your friends. And this is what we get treated to for the last hour of this film. Marita, uh -uh. this ain't no ordinary demon child. You's on your own now. Rest in peace, dip. <laughs> You missed. It kind of makes you wish they'd bring Bewitched back just so you could throw a brick at your TV. Anyway, two other Saturday Night Live defectors, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, have re-teamed up for their third Universal Studios comedy. This one is called Neighbors. Simply put, it is the story of what happens to a conservative suburbanite and his wife when they are invaded by a wild, fun-loving couple who move in next door for 24 hours. I personally thought it was very funny. But let me forewarn those of you that are looking for standard Blues Brothers-ish comedy that you won't find any of that in this bizarre comedy. Welcome to the end of the road. I guess. It's a great house. Thank you. I mean mine. More rooms than we need, really, but I couldn't resist. It was a steal. Who goes there? Hi. Zero Keith. God, either we may have to move. They're very strange people. It's impossible to do. But try to imagine yourself not being able to do one single thing except think and talk. Absolutely nothing, not even feel. And imagine that your whole reason for living up until now had been to create things with your hands. For the past six months, you have been cared for 24 hours a day by a full staff of hospital workers and they have just told you that there is absolutely no hope of you ever regaining any ability to move any part of your body except your head for the rest of your life. Then imagine that considering that gloomy forecast, you decide that you prefer to be allowed to die rather than being a talking head for the next 40 or 50 years being sustained by machines and nurses 24 hours a day. And finally, try to realize the frustration when the doctors will not allow you to make that decision and instead are forcing you to live in this condition against your will. Whose life is it, anyway? That is the title of, and the situation confronted in, a powerful new motion picture starring Richard Dreyfus. Six months after the car accident, which has left him totally paralyzed from the neck down, sculptor Ken Harrison finds himself still totally dependent for everything, 
but manages to maintain his sense of humor, especially when his loyal girlfriend makes her daily visits. Here, keep going. Okay, my kids. Mm. I got some steps to work out before the rehearsal. How's your knee? It's okay. Start warming up really carefully. Kalis is coming to the studio again. He's still interested in the large nude. Kalis always was interested in large nudes. Try and make him behave, Rodriguez. Nice meeting you. Bye. Bye. Tomorrow. All righty. Are you comfortable, Mr. Harrison? Rodriguez, you give great sheet. But as the realization of his predicament begins to set in, he gets increasingly testy with the nurses, particularly when they try to calm him down with sedatives. So the head doctor, played wonderfully by John Cassavetes, comes in to handle the situation as he sees necessary. I've decided I don't want to stay alive. Do not stick that thing in my arm. Damn you! I specifically refuse you permission to do that! It was necessary. I want you to sleep. I don't want to sleep. I want to think. Dreyfus, now even more committed to his resolve than ever, gets himself a lawyer to help him defend his right to choose his own destiny. A trial is set, and he gets to present his unique plea. Wouldn't it be more cruel for society to let people die when with some effort it could save them? No, because the cruelty is not a question of saving someone's life or letting them die. The cruelty is that the choice is removed from the person concerned. I would like to be able to decide what happens to my own body. You feel emotionally sympathetic for the judge who must make this awesome decision of either allowing him to die or refusing him that right which would, as Dreyfus pleads, be like giving him a life sentence. You feel emotionally sympathetic for the lawyer who is seeking to win a case for a client, which will bring that client's death. You feel emotionally sympathetic for Dreyfus' girlfriend and the people at the hospital who have learned to love his sense of humor and courageous wit. But most of all, you feel a tremendous sense of helplessness and frustration at the mental anguish tormenting this character to a degree that it is impossible for us to comprehend and his no-win situation that is complicated by the interference of well-meaning people on the decision of his own life. Whose life is it, anyway? One of the best and most powerful movies in years. And along with recommending that you see that movie, I recommend that you take two or three pockets full of Kleenex along with you.